This next episode is from the vault in episode 123, where Judy Gaiman helps talk about longevity and staying young. Enjoy! And it's when we stop giving of ourselves and when we stop offering up what we have that we kind of fizzle out. And I don't want your your listeners to fizzle out. I want them to live and be part of this whole living, breathing life that we have. Hey, it's Kathy with the Rocky Retirement Show, and I am so excited that you are joining us today. Today, I have Judy Gammon, who is an age to perfection expert. She's an author, and she has her own nationally syndicated radio show. So I am honored to have her on my show today. She's a graduate of the prestigious George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences and the School of Professional Studies. That is a mouthful. Try to say that as fast as you can 10 times. She learned how to tie together her knowledge of health and wellness, and she wanted to educate and inspire people. She is an award-winning author. She's had four books. She's currently working on two books right now five and six. So by the time this show is aired, who knows, maybe one or two of those will be released. But while she's not writing, you can hear her coast to coast on the airwaves. And she co-hosts the nationally syndicated show called Staying Young Show with doctors Mark Anderson and Walter Gammon of Executive Medicine of Texas. So Judy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I love the whole idea of Rocky Retirement because so many people don't realize that their life is just beginning at that stage. And this is such a perfect, perfect time for us to be talking about it. What gave you the idea of going on you know, creating this show, Staying Young? Well, that's a great question. And we actually have a book called Stay Young, 10 Proven Steps to Ultimate Health, uh, myself, Dr. Walter Gammon and Mark Anderson wrote this with me, and it's one of of several books we've written. But once we wrote that and we really kind of got that focus, we were thinking, you know, we really need to educate people. There are people that may not come to see us at Executive Medicine of Texas. They may not read the book, Stay Young, but how can we bring more information uh, out there? And there was a show that was really popular here in Dallas that had retired, and the radio station contacted us and said, you know, this show's retiring. Do you have any interest in taking up a health show? And I put them on hold, right? And I said, oh, you know, hold on a minute. I put them on hold. I jumped up and down, and I said, yes, I do. (laughs) Calm down, calm down. I hit the button again, and I said, you know, I'll reach out to the doctors. I think we might have an interest. But I was so excited because that was exactly what we had talked about doing. And what had happened is we grew in Dallas, and then we got picked up uh, by another station in North Carolina. And before we knew it, we were on 57 stations. We were nationally syndicated. People were really enjoying the show. But they were enjoying it because we made learning about being healthy, uh, we made it fun. And we made it easy to understand because there's a lot of information out there, medical information, but it's really dry. So being able to bring information to people in a way that they can understand it, you know, meet them where they are, help them gather information that they can use today and tomorrow to better themselves. And that's really where the whole Stay Young came from. Oh, my goodness. So your show is really kind of like a wellness, like a physical wellness show, right? It is, but we've tackled all kinds of topics. You know, we're talking about heart disease and diabetes and all those things, but we may have a a whole show on relationships because there have been so many studies that say if you want to live longer, you know, being married and being in a good marriage actually increases your longevity. So we tackle any topic that we can tie to longevity. And we found that it doesn't matter what we talk about. People, you know, they love to tie it in. We we can really talk about just about anything because everything we do in life, even right down to our job, you know, we've done shows on the jobs that kill you the fastest. <laughs> because oh my there's so many things. Yeah, there's so many things that that we do that we don't realize have a direct correlation to our health, our wellness, and our longevity. So do you remember what some of those jobs were? It seems like it would be high stress kind of jobs. It is. 
It is. And unfortunately, doctors don't live as long. I was going to say, I was going to say, that must be like the shortest lifespan ever. (laughs) It is. A lot of it is tied to when they're in residency, they don't get a lot of sleep and just being on call. Now we have hospitalists and things. So I think over time, this will change. But doctors go decades without getting full night's sleeps on a regular basis because, you know, it used to be their beepers were going off, now their cell phones. But really, they're always tied to that person that might need help on the other side. There were some other ones, you know, construction workers, uh, and a lot of that has to do with physical, the things that go on physically. You're really out in the sun a lot, so you know, you're getting skin cancer, you're, you're doing a lot of physical things, and then you can have safety issues. A lot mm-hmm. of uh, construction workers have injuries on the job. Right, football players. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, don't even get me started on that. They are probably, uh, you know, professional sports players have really low longevity. So I like to say they sell their soul a little bit because they have, they, you know, they get out there, they, they do their thing, they have the fame, they have the money, but then they come see us and we're trying to put them back together. And it's really hard because a lot of times they suffer concussions, they've blown out their knees, they've had hip replacements, and it's tough. Wouldn't they also have, like, depression when all of a sudden they're not famous anymore or they're like – you know, famous from five years ago, they'll be like, oh, yeah, whatever. Uh, it seems to me that would be the worst part. It is. It is. We did a show. We had, uh, we had a professional football player, and he told us, he was retired, he told us the most interesting stories. He said, first of all, he didn't realize what concussions were going to do to him. Secondly, he had never grown up in a family that had money. So he had money, and mm. he went through it, and then all of a sudden – he didn't have enough money because he had spent it all, but he just, in his mind, didn't realize, hey, I should save some of this. So that created a whole nother kind of stress. And then when people stopped recognizing him in public, right. it caused a, a lot of depression. When uh, they don't tell these football players either what they need to do to maintain their health when they're lo- no longer on the football field. And this goes for all, all sports, really. But with him, he had gained like 200 pounds. That would, that would already, make sense because they're out there yeah. burning like, what, 50,000 calories or something? On the football. I know, I mean, right? Crazy. And that's only in one hour. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and they're, they're being told, eat, eat, eat. And they're being always fed lots of food. So they get used to eating a lot of food, high calories. And then all of a sudden, boom, they're, you know, they're no longer running and doing all of these things. And those, you know, before the game exercise and off season exercises, all that's gone and they don't know how to cope. So it's really a a unique profession and my heart goes out to them. Oh, yeah. Now, most of my listeners obviously are not professional, you know, (laughs) football players. They're just regular people, you know, thinking about retiring And that's what I love about your, you know, what you just said about your show is that it's really about wellness. That's what we talk about here on the Rocky Retirement Show. I put together a little Facebook Live and I'm putting together some other documentation where we talk about the six pillars of retirement lifestyle. And those are the spiritual, your significant other, you've already talked about your marital relationships friendship, work, health, and family. Have you found those six pillars topics of your show? Absolutely. Pick one and we could talk for an hour. (laughs) Every one of these are so, so important. Family, huge, huge. Socialization just out in in general is so important. There was a study that came out of BYU. I'm not sure if you read this. It wasn't that, that long ago. And they looked at longevity and what were the factors for people living longer and healthier lives. And you would think that diet and exercise, would one of those would be at the top, right? Well, actually, socialization was the number one factor. So this means getting out and, and greeting people, saying hi to people, being out, seeing faces, all of the, you know, touching people. All of these things are so important to our overall health. We've, we've gotten to a point, and I don't know if your seniors have fallen into this. I'm shocked how many seniors are carrying around smartphones. They're on uh, <laughs> Facebook. They're, they're, I've even known some seniors that are tweeting. They're doing all these things because <laughs> they want to stay connected. It's a great way to track your grandkids, right, and, and be connected. But we have to remember that there's no substitution for good old-fashioned hugs. 
And we need to make sure that we're out there getting and giving those hugs, giving people smiles, talking to people. And it's really easy as you age, and especially once you're out of the workforce, to have a day or two or three, and unfortunately, sometimes this is a week, where people don't get out of the house and go do that. It's critical to their well-being. Do you think, okay, so I'm going off topic here, but I just got an email from one of my listeners today. And he was talking about this whole socialization. You know, he, he listened to my episode on the six pillars and he emailed me and said, basically, you know, it was, a, it was kind of a long, a long email, but at the end he said, men don't typically get together just to say hi, just to have coffee. He said, he was telling me he didn't really know what to do to get this socialization in. He's in his eighties. What advice would you give to him? And, you know, in the past, I've told people, oh, even if you're an atheist, go to church. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you'll, right? get your, you'll get Can't your hugs. <laughs> exactly. Um, but what would you tell somebody who, especially a man, I think it's easier for women, to get some socialization? Where would he go? Well, first of all, you know, church, that's a, a great, great outlet. Uh, the senior center, perfect. But, but think outside the box. Get out there and volunteer. There are lots of places, schools and stuff, where people that are 80, you know, 70, 80, 90, kids love that. You, the parents love that. Participate. Get out there. Volunteer. There's sites that, that connect you uh, to volunteer opportunities. Get out there and serve because nothing keeps you healthier than service. And this is a great opportunity for someone who's 80. And you don't even have to be that physically fit. You know, you can sit and read a book uh, to, to kids. And, and there's so many things that, that you can do. There's a battered women's shelter. You can go there. They need, they need to hear from, from men that actually cherished women so they can get that jerk out of their head, you know, and realize there are good people. They, they need to, to mentor other people. This is one thing that I'm not sure where the disconnect is. I would like to see more seniors taking a mentorship role. And this doesn't mean going out and reparenting. You know, they've already been there and done that. But find someone that they can mentor. You know, my best friend who died just shy of her 104th birthday, Lucille, she and I were attached to the hip for almost four years. She even went out on book tour with me. We had a blast. And... I learned so much from her. She was just filled with incredible information and incredible advice. And we taught each other things. I took her out for her first bite of sushi. You know, <laughs> she said, I can't believe I never tried this before. <laughs> but there's so many things that, that we can be doing. And we got to get past the age thing. Now, how did you meet her? How did you have a best friend who was 104? I'm assuming that you're not anywhere near that age. I'm not near that age, <laughs> uh, but this is what happened. I was working on a book called Age to Perfection, How to Thrive to 100, Happy, Healthy, and Wise. I was going through all the research. I was sitting there just delved into mounds and mounds of resources, writing this book, and it came to me. Why don't I just ask the people that are over 100? You know, how, how did they get there? This is like such a, a no-brainer. Why am I reading all these studies? So I set out to find people over 100 that were active, and it really wasn't hard. And people think, oh, that's really hard. It wasn't hard at all. I, I found these people really fast. Actually, my writing assistant found them, and she said, well, here's this lady across town, and man, you got to get in to see her, but she's got a huge social calendar. I don't, <laughs> I don't know when she can pencil you in, <laughs> but you got to talk to her. She's fantastic. So I, I tell you what, from the second she and I met, it was like – boom, we were best friends. And we just hit it off. We started spending time together. We started having lunch every Friday. I changed my work schedule. And before I knew it, we were flying off on book tours. And she became a longevity expert. And I had her on TV. And, you know, we just had a blast together. But that's really when I started to really live. And there are so many people out there that are like me that had workaholic parents that didn't really have that kind of mentor in their life. And having Lucille in my life changed my life forever, hands down. Wow. So let's say we've got some people listening today and they would like to connect 
you know, with somebody, maybe they would like to mentor them or be mentored by somebody over a hundred, <laughs> where would they find people like this? Yeah. So if somebody's listening and they really want to get out there and, and mentor people, first of all, here's what you need to do. You need to get out and join these social organizations. You know, there's Kiwanis, there's Rotary, there's uh, newcomers clubs for people that are just moving into town uh, that don't know anybody. I mean, that's a prime place to find somebody that you can build a relationship because they don't know anybody. Uh, I made so many friends in our newcomers club. I wasn't even a newcomer. I'm like, you guys are to kick me out. I went here like, I don't know, 15 <laughs> years, and, <laughs> and I'm still coming to this. It's, it's really uh, a great way, though, to socialize. But getting involved in those things, look for charity events. And go to the charity events. You know, if you're a golfer, go to the golf tournaments. If you're, if you are you into fashion, go to the fashion shows. There's, there's so many charity opportunities, and you can really get to meet people. But don't just go to the event. Go volunteer to help with the event because that's where you start building those relationships. Get on those committees. Don't just sit there and not give of your time and your talents and your energy because I don't care if you're 80, like the gentleman who wrote into you. You've got something to offer, and it's when we stop giving of ourselves and when we stop offering up what we have that we kind of fizzle out, and I don't want your your listeners to fizzle out. I want them to live and be part of this whole living, breathing life that we have. That is great advice. You know, my pastor last week, okay, they're, they're looking for volunteers, and the problem is the average age of my church is 85. <laughs> Everyone's oh, wow. Like, yeah, I go, I don't know why, how we got involved in this church, but it's so warm and so friendly. You know, that older age group is just very welcoming and loving, and we, we really enjoy this church. Plus, they have the old music. I'm not into the rock band current music. I know. Me neither. I call it Six Flags Over Jesus. I know people love it, but <laughs> but I literally, I I love the old hymns. I'm yes. right there with you. Yeah. So that's, we go to a church with the old hymns. I don't have to put earplugs in. It's It's wonderful. But he got up last week and said, you know, if you're breathing, you can volunteer. <laughs> There's <laughs> something <love> <laughs> you can do. There's something you can do if you're breathing. So, you know, we'll see if it works for him. But <laughs> so I, I totally, love it. yeah, so it, it just points to what you just said, that there's no age limit on volunteering. You can find something to do, right? Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And it's when you stop giving of your yourself that, that you kind of, you kind of get forgotten. I hate to say that, but you know, if you're not out there and you're not meeting people and and helping others and getting letting other people know you, then you're also depriving them of that opportunity. Because I really believe that in everybody is something to share. Everybody has a story. Even if you have listeners that have had a rough go of it, they're like, you know, I've had like some really bad things happen in my life. Well, you know what? Somebody else could could really benefit from hearing that because maybe they feel like they're the only ones that have had a bad thing happen in their life. So even the bad things can be turned into such good things. It can give hope. It can give all kinds of new life to people. And that's really a, a message that, that your listeners need to understand. You know what? You're so right. And my listeners know that my husband was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer. And he started, he, he's doing great, by the way, but he started a blog with all of the things that he's done. And so he's using that diagnosis to help others. So you're absolutely right. Even in dark times, you can figure out a way to turn that around and use it for good. I love he's doing that. And he's done that. That's, that's terrific. Yes. You know, that actually has probably helped heal him. Because when you do that, when you turn a negative into a positive, it actually heals you. So that was terrific that he did that. Yes, I'm very excited about it. And we'll talk a little bit more when we come back from the break. So if you've just joined us, we're here with Judy from The Stayin' Young Show, and we'll be right back after this break. Do you want to make sure that you never miss an episode of the Rock Your Retirement Show? Did you know you can subscribe to the show? It's easy. We're in all the major podcast apps, including 
iTunes, iHeartRadio, Podcast Addict, Stitcher, and more. All you need to do is go to your favorite podcast app and search for the Rock Your Retirement Show. Or if you need more help, just go to rockyourretirement.com slash subscribe and you'll find a short tutorial for either an iPhone or an Android phone. It's easy. Welcome back to the Rock Your Retirement Show. And I'm here with Judy from the Stain Young Show. She has a show that is nationally syndicated, a little bit different than mine. It's actually a live show, a little scary for me, but she's obviously a professional. Judy, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. And for your listeners who are really into podcasting, when our show's done airing, it actually goes to podcast under Stain Young Show 2.0. So they can always look it up that way. Well, I'm going to have a link to it in the show notes as well. So thank you for bringing that up. So you have been doing this show for how long? Oh, I think we're in our seventh year. It's it's been a long time. (laughs) It's really, it's been a, it's been a good time though. It really has. Uh, You really get to know your co-hosts in ways that you didn't think you were going to because you never know what they're going to say. You know, (laughs) something could come out of their mouth and you're like, tell me how you really feel. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you one thing that happened on our show that you might get a laugh out of. It's it's really offensive, but I'm going to tell you anyways. (laughs) So uh, two of the doctors that I'm on the show with, Dr. Gammon and Dr. Anderson, Dr. Anderson is very much the guy's guy and Dr. Gammon is very much a chess player. And we were talking about this problem with childhood obesity and the rise in diabetes in our younger kids. And Dr. Anderson just says, well, if all you moms would stop shoving Cheetos down your fat kids' faces, oh we my wouldn't have this epidemic. Gosh. I nearly died, right? <laughs> and I'm like, we got to cut that out. This is terrible. Yeah, I was so upset. And we got so much mail. But it was all like <laughs> of support. This is what everyone's thinking, but nobody's saying it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I know you're on the show by yourself. Sometimes that could be a blessing. I just want you to know that. (laughs) Yeah, if anybody messes up, it's all my fault. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody to blame. Yeah, so so, um, what was your favorite? Do you have a favorite thing that happened on the show over the last seven years? Uh, well, I do have a favorite thing. It might be a little off color, so well, you know, you we can talk let about, me know. <laughs> we talk about sex on this show, but we don't use bad words. So how how is okay. that? Okay, <laughs> it's not going to have any bad words. I promise. And before we talk, if you're listening with small children on the on the line, you know, put your headsets on and uh, then come back in a few more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go good. ahead. That's that's good. Okay. So Dr. Anderson, uh, again, of course, he's the one I always have to talk about. So we were doing a show on drug interactions and drug side effects. And we were going over a lot of very serious things. We were talking about you know, how Viagra was really originally a cardiac drug, but what they found out was every time they put gave it to somebody and they put them on a treadmill for a cardiac stress test, <laughs> they got an erection. And so they're like, wait, there's more money in this. So that's kind of the story behind Viagra. So Dr. Anderson happens to tell our audience, well, I just want you to know that commercial that says, if you have a four-hour erection, you know, call, go to the emergency room or call your physician. He goes, I'm not calling my physician or go to the emergency room. I'm getting that put on my tombstone. <laughs> Before I die, I'm calling everybody I know. <laughs> Every girl I've ever met, I got four hours. And I, of course, I was like mortified, right? I was like, I can't believe you just said that. But again, it was like one of those shows where everyone was calling and everyone was writing that this was great radio. I'm like, I, I really need to get in touch with our audience because I'm mortified by this. But he just thought it was terrific. <laughs> well, I think that's one of those other ones that people are thinking it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, nobody's saying it, right? They're thinking it. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. My husband, I don't remember when we had this conversation, but we had a conversation about this. And we said that... On the commercials where they say, call your doctor if you have an erection over four hours, we said no one actually ever has an erection over four hours. They just put that in there as a marketing ploy. (laughs) Oh, I agree. I agree. (laughs) I think think your husband's right. (laughs) Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Well, it sounds like you've had some great time on the show. What is something that you learned 
about getting older that surprised you? I would say the, the, the biggest surprise about getting older is the new science that we have behind longevity that we didn't have. Even, you know, when we started this show, things that we talked about, uh, the new things that have come about, like you know, measuring telomeres. You know, telomeres are in the end of your chromosomes, and they're, think of them as like the little um, caps on the ends of shoelaces, right? And as they shorten, your life shortens. So the idea is to keep those uh, just keep those long as long as you can because you don't want the cell to die. You don't want that aging process to progress. And if you think of life kind of as a candle, you know, the candle burns out and there you are, you're done. And I I really have to be surprised by not just the telomeres, but all the things that we're learning now. Um, inflammation. Inflammation is like the key. We weren't really talking about that even you know, five, six years ago, not to the degree we are now, where we realize that inflammation is linked to Alzheimer's and heart disease and all of these things, and it all kind of stems back to the same place. And that really, I think, is an epiphany for all of the medical community, and it also ties in some of these other things, like the nutritionists who have been saying for years, hey, we've really got to get people's diets under control. You know, we're creating these diseases of course, they at the time they may not have known why it was so important to have all of these phytonutrients and such. They knew it was important. We knew that it was good to prevent cancer and heart disease, diabetes, all these things. But now we kind of understand the science behind it on a really, really small cellular level as to what happens to the body when we eat packaged and processed foods. You know, the the research behind artificial sweeteners, which, you know, in the beginning was all kind of brushed away, like, oh, you know, no, I don't believe this. And now they're coming out and going, mm, yeah, mm, probably, yeah, this is bad. And they're slowly bringing you know, the food industry around. And you'll see now labels that say no artificial colors, no artificial sweeteners, no artificial flavors, because they've realized, yeah, there really is something to this science. So just the the change in and how we treat disease from a preventative side, I think, is the biggest eye-opener uh, from the beginning of the time we started doing the show until now. Hmm. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a personal question. Okay. Have you made any changes to your life as a direct result of what you've learned or discussed on the show? Hmm. Yes. And I'll tell you what it was, and this is going to shock you. We started talking, doing a lot of talk about um, genetics and epigenetics and the personal um, genome project, and we were talking about this, you know, why do some people have the genes to get sick and then they don't, while a sibling may have the same genes and then they do. And we really kind of delve into that, and George Church was doing a lot of work on the personal genome project, and was working a lot with, you've probably heard of 23andMe. And that's where people can get their DNA sequenced. But now, you know, it's really marketed more for check, you know, trace your ancestry. Well, a lot of that has to do because the FDA came in and people were finding out things in their genetic code that they thought they weren't prepared to know. Now, before the FDA came in there, you could get your DNA sequenced and you could find out a lot of stuff, right? I So I was one of the first people, myself and my husband, Dr. Gammon, we both decided, hey, let's do this, right? And we did it, and we did it early on when they were having a lot of health professionals do it. And when I got the results, you know, it came in a, like an email link, and it asked you, you sure you want to know this, right? And you click yes. And then you get another one. Are you really sure? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, well, I don't know. Maybe I don't want to know this. <laughs> but I, my mother suffers from Alzheimer's disease, and I found out that I have a five times more likely risk for Alzheimer's. And it empowered me. It, instead of frightening me, which I know some people it might really frighten them, it empowered me because now there's so much research on Alzheimer's and the causes and the prevention of it. We don't know how to cure it yet, but we sure know how to take steps to prevent it. So that information, you know, even doing that test all stemmed back to 
shows we were doing on genetics and epigenetics and then being in that position to know and we were talking on the show well would you want to know would you not want to know i said i think i'd want to know well you don't really know if you really want to know until you know (laughs) and once i knew i was like how i i can handle this because i i can see it i can plan for it there's even a study i guess this came out hmm, maybe a year now And they took functional MRI and they looked at brains when people sleep. And what they found was amazing. They found that when we sleep and we get into that deep REM sleep, we actually, our brain washes itself. We have fluids that go through our brain and scrub it like a washing machine. And that's what cleans up the plaques and the things that lead to dementia and Alzheimer's. So if we don't get adequate sleep, adequate sleep meaning seven and a half to eight hours a night, uninterrupted deep sleep. If we don't get that, our brains don't get washed out. They don't get scrubbed out. They don't get cleaned out. And that puts us at a higher risk, much higher risk for dementia and Alzheimer's. So just being religious about going to bed, I mean, that seems like a very simple thing, right? But now I'm like, I have to go to sleep. You know, I'm really weird about how many hours of sleep I get. I knew that my mom was not a sleeper. She didn't go to sleep. And when she did go to sleep, she'd sleep four hours here and five hours the next night. And she was not religious about her sleep. So it's one thing that I can do as a preventative measure against what I found out in my genetic testing. Do they still give you that information or is it just purely for finding out who your ancestors are now? You know, I think they give you some information, but it's like, you know, does your pee stink when you you, uh, eat? asparagus. Well, Mm -hmm. you could just go eat asparagus and smell your pee and know that. I mean, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, But there, yeah, I think they give you some information, but it's not nearly at the level that that we got it. Um, But even at Executive Medicine of Texas, we started doing some genetic testing um, as a result even of of the things that we learned on the show. So we're doing uh, genetic testing on on how we age. Certain people age differently. Certain people have different risks for for different things in aging. I actually had my my DNA tested for the best way for me to exercise. Yeah. I found out that I have this gene defect too that also means I need to take, when I take B vitamins, I need to be methylated, which explains why B vitamins always used to give me migraine headaches. And now I take methylated and I'm fine. Um, but I, I was working out and I was going to this place called the Perfect Workout. I don't know if you have them all over, but it's really uh, strengthening exercises. And I, I went to him. I said, I'm bulking up. I don't want to bulk up. You know, I'm sure when I bulk up, I, I look like Popeye. I don't want that. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 you can't bulk up on this program. I'm like, look, it, I can't fit into my suits. What, you know, no, this isn't working. And so when I had this genetic testing done, one of the things it says is I should limit my strengthening exercises because I am prone to bulk. Of course, I took that whole test right up there and go, I told you, you know, <laughs> of course. Uh, but but that was something I needed to know. And it also told me that in order for me to lower my weight and maintain my weight, the number one thing for me is going to be cardio. And uh, and you may say, well, that's for everybody. Not necessarily, because it was trumped above even eating right. So some people just can cut back on their food and they're going to lose weight. Some people it's cardio. Some people it's muscle building. You know, there's everyone has a different uh, map, so to speak, on how to get lean. And I was given my map, and I was so grateful for that. Wow. And you did that at your medical clinic? Uh, where, where did you yeah. get that done? What's it called? Yeah, again? Executive Executive Medicine of Texas. So tell me what that clinic does. Oh, thank you for the opportunity to share. The, at Executive Medicine of Texas, we do executive physicals or executive style physicals, which means you're there for a half day. And you're going through a battery of tests. We have people from all over the globe come to us. And and I'm not kidding. We have like this whole following in Bermuda. I'm not sure what that's about. But we we do. We have people from all over different countries and, and right here in our own backyard. They come to see us. They're there for a half day. They're put through the ringer of every test you can imagine, over 100 different lab values, you know, stress tests. If they haven't had CTs, then we can do a CT body scan. You know, that's not something you want to do every year because of the radiation. Um, we just we go through a battery of things. We do autonomic nervous system testing, and we, we can look for peripheral vascular disease. I mean, you name it, we test it. Then they're given a leather binder with all of these results and a map basically saying, okay, here's what we found, and here's what we need to do about it. 
And people can then black and white, right? Here's the information, and here's the way to – you're on the road to, to diabetes. Okay, here's the course correct. This is what you do to keep from getting it. Maybe you already have signs and symptoms of coronary artery disease. All right, we don't want you to get to the next step of that. Here's how we can turn that train around. And it's all about prevention, and it's all about really putting your body back on track. And people come to us from all different status of of health. I mean, we could see an athlete one day, and we could see somebody who is highly overweight and and maybe you know 65, 67 years old, and they're really saying, look, I don't want to die in the next 10 years. And we can get them turned around. And we love it because that's our passion and that's what we do. And I, I can't say enough about it. I thank you for letting me share because it's, it's truly a, an honor to work there. Wow. Now, did you and your husband start this program or did you join it after it was started? No, we... We sat down. It is do- now there's my husband and who's a physician, and Mark Anderson who's a physician, mm-hmm. and they were the founders. And they were at a point, and this was 2004, where they said, "I hate being a doctor. I hate ch- you know arguing with insurance companies, chasing after the bills, being told we can't run this test or that test." So a lot of my patients, I tell them they have to quit smoking. They basically don't care. I, this is not why I went to medical school. This is not why I wanted to be in this profession. And we were at breakfast and I said, oh, okay, if you could do medicine any way you wanted. And we took out a napkin. I mean, no joke. This is a true napkin idea. And I said, what would it look like? So we made like this list, right? Well, the, the building would be beautiful. We'd be able to order the tests we want. We'd have the best staff we could find. We'd not be limited to the amount of time that we spent with somebody. I mean, all of these things on, on a napkin. And I said, okay, why don't we do it? And they're like, you can't do that. Nobody's ever done that. What do you mean don't take insurance? You know? I'm like, well, we can't have it both ways. If you're going to take insurance and you're going to pay a, a business officer to chase after a claim, you can't spend as much time as you want with the people and, and do the tests that you want to do. And so we went on a leap of faith and opened up Executive Medicine of Texas started seeing, first of all, it was was mostly executives and corporate accounts. And then word started spreading and people were sending us their families and, you know, their parents. And then people were coming from other states and then people were coming from other countries. And then we had to get, take out more space. And then we ran out of space. We had to move into a new building. (laughs) And all of these things have been so terrific because people's lives are changed. You know, it's really remarkable. We've seen people that were, I've got to retire, not because I want to retire, but because I don't have any gas left in the tank. And we're like, okay, well, we just realized you have a thyroid nodule that is really large and it's excreting all kinds of things. Let's get that out. You know, your, your hormones are in the tank, you know, all of these things. And then all of a sudden they're like, I feel like I have a new life. (laughs) And um, it's amazing. And we've seen people that maybe are widowed or have gone through a divorce. So they're single and they really were at a point where they just didn't care. You know, I don't really want a relationship. I don't care. And they were in this just humdrum day-to-day rut. And then their health improves. And all of a sudden, they're, you know, they got a new wife and they're <laughs> a new husband. And, but, you know, life's good and they're traveling. And it just, I, I, it just warms my heart because this is what life's supposed to be about. But I think when you have uh, physicians, we have other physicians on staff and uh, that we've hired, and we also have nurse practitioners and PAs and fitness director and all this. But when you have people that are truly passionate about what they do, when somebody walks in our door, we know who they are. A lot of these patients have our doctor's cell phones in numbers in their phone on speed dial because they're on a concierge program. And it's, it's just the way medicine was supposed to be. It, it's that's the way it's supposed to be. It wasn't supposed to be what it's turned into. Well, I love the fact you're doing that. Is is um, now? I'm assuming that this is not hundreds of dollars, but thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. What kind of price range is for this half day testing that you do? Yes. So the uh, the basic test, which is called the gold level physical, is one thousand nine hundred fifty dollars. Okay. And then the platinum, which you know gets you a virtual colonoscopy, which is done on the CT machine a body scan, a VO2 max on your stress test, and all these extra testing, uh, that is 4900 And then there's concierge programs, 
and which some of which include hormone therapy and and other items and you know they they kind of range from there the only thing we have that's over 10,000 we have a concierge family plan that's 135 okay. So it's really reasonable. And I know there are doctors around that are, you know, doing twenty five, thirty, forty thousand dollars a year for concierge. You know, we're there to get as many people through the door as we can to 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 help them. And I you know, we we could have said we're gonna take twenty people at thirty thousand dollars and no more. Right. But you wanna get the word out. Yeah, you wanna help people. Yeah, and what good are we doing if we're sitting on the golf course the other half of the day when there's so many people that we could be helping? So making as reasonable as we could um, and then offering as many tests as we could for, for that price. And every year we're adding new things because there's been new technology. If you're listening to this program, just understand that we are recording this in March of 2018. By the time you listen to this, the pricing may have changed. So be sure to check the website, give them a call to know what the current prices are. Yeah, the website is em. Texas.com. And I'll be sure to put that in the show notes as well. You know, I could talk with you all day. Actually, we didn't talk about anything today that I had planned on talking about. And so I may have to have you come back on the show. <laughs> it would time. be my pleasure to be back on the show. You're a blast. Well, I had a great time. So thank you so much. How can my listener uh, reach you again? So they can either go to the website emtexas.com emtexas.com and that is uh, the website for Executive Medicine of Texas or if they're interested in having me speak to a group that they're in uh, they can go to judygammon.com Judy G-A-M-A-N that's judygammon.com Okay, great. And I will be sure to have links to that in the show notes as well. So Judy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. And for the listener, we'll see you next time on Rock Your Retirement.